Well, one of the first things I learned was that when, when I was born, there was no Israel. So where did this come from? Well, what I discovered was that there was a movement uh, that began over a century ago and began operating in Europe and in the United States. It was, a, was and is a political movement that has profoundly and negatively impacted our country. It has tragically impacted the Middle East and it has dangerously impacted the entire world. And yet most of us, I think, have never heard of it and could certainly not define it. It's political Zionism. This was a movement to create a Jewish state in Palestine. It began in the late 1800s. Well, let us look at Palestine in the late 1800s. It was what we largely think of now as a somewhat multicultural land in that it was about 80% Muslim, about 15% Christian, and about 5% Jewish, all living together quite successfully. There are mosques, synagogues, uh, churches throughout Palestine, throughout the Middle East, and throughout North Africa. These populations had been living without conflict for centuries. But this movement was, was created largely in Israel, uh, largely in Europe, and then taken up at the same time in the US, to create a Jewish state on land that was already inhabited, in which 95% were not Jewish. Therefore, this would involve, and this was known by the leadership, even though many followers didn't know it, this would mean that 95% of those people were going to be dispossessed by money, if possible, by force, if necessary. This was written in, in Zionist journals early on. Now, my book and my talk concentrates on the US aspect of all of this. What surprised me in my research is how early and how active this movement was in the United States, a movement I'd never heard of, although I was born here, and my parents were born here, and some ancestors go back to the beginning. It turns out that this was a very significant movement long before my parents were born. And then by 1910, there were already 20,000 Zionists in the US. They included lawyers, professors, and businessmen. It was already in 1910 a movement to which congressmen listened. Then in 1912, we had a very significant development. A prominent lawyer named Louis Brandeis became a Zionist. Brandeis not only just be, didn't just become a Zionist, within about two years, he then became the head of world Zionism. This was, a pub, this was public, it's not some secret knowledge, it's just that most of us don't know it. And then within a few years, he was also a Supreme Court Justice, named by Woodrow Wilson. When you're a Supreme Court Justice, you're supposed to resign your various board memberships and affiliations because you're supposed to not have any conflict of interest but be neutral. So he did resign his leadership of world Zionism, but in reality, he continued it. He would receive reports in his Supreme Court chambers by his loyal lieutenants, and then he would give them directives to go out and to uh, follow in work for Zionism. And this is mentioned in a number of very reliable books. If you get my book, you'll see that my book is over half footnotes. It's all cited. By the way, one of his loyal lieutenants also went on to become a very prominent Supreme Court Justice, Felix Frankfurter. So I'd read that. That to me was shocking right there. But then I discovered something more. So I'll give you my citations for this next information so you can evaluate whether you find it reliable or not. I, the way I did my research is I, I would read books, then I would look at their footnotes to see where they had gotten that information. Then I would often get those books and read those footnotes and then order those books and read those footnotes and on and on. So one of the books that I read was re really a fairly uh, well-known one. Israel in the Mind of America, published by a very mainstream establishment publisher, and the author was a very mainstream author. 
He had been diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times. He had been at Harvard. He had written a number of well-regarded, very establishment nonfiction books. Well, in this book, he had a few pages in which he told about a secret Zionist society that had operated in the United States of which Louis Brandeis, while a Supreme Court justice, had been a leader. So I looked at where he got that information, and I went to that source. It turned out to be from a scholarly journal called the American Jewish Historical Quarterly, a very respected journal. So then I looked at the author. Well, is this a reliable author? Who wrote this very, to me, explosive information? And turned out to be a, a well-regarded Israeli historian at a, a mainstream uh, Israeli university. She had written an article in 1975 called The Parashim, a secret episode in American Zionist history. Uh, and she told about what this was, an elitist secret society. The word meant Pharisees and separate. They would go around the country and influence people to push the Zionist agenda. By the way, at this time, the Jewish population were not Zionists at all. The large majority were not Zionists. Many were opposed to Zionism. This was a, a very, very fringe uh, element to a certain regard. Then in this secret society, they even had a secret induction ceremony so that when somebody joined this society, and many, their membership included professors and Harvard, you know, recent Harvard graduates and uh, doctors, significant people around the country were sometimes members. And in this initiation ceremony, they were told by the inductor, and they swore to this, until our purpose shall be accomplished, you will be the fellow of a brotherhood whose bond you will regard as greater than any other in your life dearer than that of family, of school, of nation. As early as November 1915, a leader of the Parashim went around suggesting that the British might gain some benefit from a formal declaration in support of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Those of you who have heard of the Balfour Declaration that came in 1917 might find this relevant. I'll get into that a little bit more. Let's remember what was going on during this time period now in the world, especially that involved Britain. Well, of course, in 1914 began what was called at that time the Great War of massive carnage. British forces in the first day of the Battle of the Somme lost, according to historians, somewhere around 50,000 to 60,000 men in one day of a battle that went on and on and on. The British and the German, both sides of course, wanted the U.S. to come in on their side to join this carnage. But the American population were that bad thing, they were isolationists. They didn't want to go kill and be killed in a foreign pointless war.